Well, hello, thank you so much for joining us tonight for the final presentation from the James Castle House resident, Jean Sean. My name is Mackenzie Lawrence. I'm the Cultural Sites Program Coordinator for the City of Boise uh, for the Department of Arts and History. Um, so please note that this event is being recorded and will be available online in the coming days. Um, English language captioning is available by clicking live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting show subtitle. Before we move on to the event, I'd like to give a little introduction to the James Castle House. For anyone who's not familiar with us, uh, the James Castle House celebrates the life and work of American artist James Castle through exhibitions, community programming, research, residency programs, and conservation of the historic spaces where Castle lived and worked for over four decades. The James Castle House is a program of the Boise City Department of Arts and History, which offers many other services, including public art, history, grants, archives, care and conservation, and other educational opportunities. I would like to thank the City of Boise for its ongoing support and for remaining committed to the work that we're doing in the Arts and History Department. We would like to acknowledge the broader history um, of the land that the James Castle House sits on. We recognize the ancestral, cultural, traditional, and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute uh, people whose land the site is on today. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and your continued support of the arts and cultural community. Uh, we encourage your engagement with this event and we'll have a question and answer period at the end of Jean's presentation. Uh, this is a hybrid event with an audience inside the gallery with us as well as on Zoom. So in order to make sure everyone has a chance to hear the questions being answered, I will repeat questions from our in-person audience. And if you're joining us virtually tonight, please feel free to write your questions, your thoughts and your questions and the question and answer uh, button throughout the presentation. And I will read those as well. And before we get on to things, I want to mention a couple special events we have coming up from the, for the James Castle House this month and next. Um, we have the 2024 call for residents open for both shore and long stay residents. The call closes August 11th, and we encourage all emerging and mid-career artists to consider applying. More information is available on our website, jamescastlehouse.org, for details. And next we have our next exhibition interlude, a five-year residency retrospective, which opens August 10th. We're elated to share the works of, um, that have been donated to the city of Boise by James Castle House residents uh, over the last five years with you, alongside corresponding castle pieces to highlight the unique connections that these artists were able to establish with Boise, the house and James Castle himself. And now onto the main event. Uh, through the context of her own family and community history, Jean Sean is able to channel historic ephemera and fragments to connect the past and present. Her techniques range from layering, reduction, transferal processes, and digital manipulation to reconcile with loss and preserve history. This healing process manifests in the way of immersive installations, photography, image-based pieces, and text. Jean received her Master of Fine Arts from the University of California, Irvine, and a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She has participated in several res residencies, including the Galveston Artist Residency, Searles Place, and Prairie Ronde Artist Residency. She's also, uh, she recently has exhibited in solo and group shows in various locations from Southern California to Idaho to Texas. She is currently an educator based in Texas. Please welcome Jean Sean. Thank you, Kenzie, for that introduction. Um, I just want to thank you to say thank you to everybody joining here in person and for those who are joining online. Um, I want to say thanks to everybody at the James Castle House and the City of Boise for um, the opportunity to be an artist in residence here. Everyone has been so helpful and supportive. Um, special thanks to Kenzie, who has um, been helping me with my day-to-day um, life here in Boise, um, to Kristen and Mackenzie and Sam uh, and everybody else here at James Castle. Um, I also want to give a huge thank you to the Maker Lab at um, Boise State University. Um, Caleb and Itzi who run that space um, at using their facility has been very integral to my work. So um, I wouldn't have been able to complete uh, my work here without them. Um, 
So this is actually my second time in Boise. I did a, a residency at Cyril's Place um, in 2021. So it's really nice to see some familiar faces. So I just want to say thanks to Greg and Trish and to Jody for welcoming me back to Boise. All right, so um, I just wanted to start off with um, this piece here. I visited the James Castle Collection and Archive and these were some of my favorite pieces. Um, there are these text-based pieces or uh, what I think Sam called litter form anatomy um, that I really liked. Uh, if you just, at first glance, you might think they're just like pieces of paper or you know some packaging. Um, but upon closer inspection, you'll see that James Castle has um, actually cut them and pasted them back together very meticulously. It might be a little bit hard to see on screen. Um, and th these are pieces that you really should you know, see in person. Um, they're so very carefully considered and there's a lot of, I think like hidden labor in them. And something that I really like about these is that it's trying to see each fragment um, as its own piece or as its own object um, because then it takes it out of that the word and you, it becomes a different shape or symbol and um, something that you haven't really considered or looked at before. Not sure we're able to go out. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, when I first got to the residency, I read a lot about James Castle and his work, um, and I really just took the time to take in the space to use as inspiration for what I might create. And so um, one of the first things I did was take a look inside the shed. So this is right next to the James Castle house. Um, and that was his working studio when he was living here. Um, and I was really drawn to sort of the traces uh, of the things that were kind of left behind, um, looking at the tears and the material that's sort of like peeking underneath. Um, here you can see, you know, like the paint kind of peeling off and just all the scratches on the cabinetry and just things that, you know, generally you wouldn't really notice or think twice about. Um, here you can see, you know, with marks, um, some like streaks and stuff, and even his fingerprints where, you know, he did a lot of the soot and spit drawings. And so you can kind of see like the black um, smudges on the cabinets as well. And Looking at this even closer, I just started seeing a lot of patterns and textures and from the, the that were emerging from the paint that was chipping off. And I just, I knew that I wanted to do something with it. So um, I, I wasn't quite sure what, but I did want to experiment with, with a couple of new processes here at the James Castle House. Um, I knew that there was a press and um, I wanted to try printmaking for the first time. And so I decided to take uh, fragments or um, zoomed in shots of these uh, pieces of, you know, the walls and the cabinetry and things. Um, and here you can see that um, you can see like the markings of the paint peeling off and the colors that I decided to use uh, were what was kind of peeking underneath. So you can kind of see the bases of it or um, some markings and traces. Uh, so again, you can see on the left side is, um, the, you know, the actual photograph from the shed, and then the right is the print that I made from it. Um, so here you can, I took the color from that bottom um, right hand corner where you could kind of see sort of that brownish yellowish color that was, you know, kind of peeking through there. Here you can kind of see that blue marking. I don't know if it says apparent um, on the screen or in the photo, but uh, I wanted to kind of just bring out the, the, those like more vibrant colors. And so this is a collection. I did six of them in total um, from the shed. And I also visited the trailer, which um, was James Castle's dream home. And I went to the special collections at Boise State University. And they actually have a really great archive of James Castle's um, work and also mainly his um, more like family stuff, which was really nice to see, um, just like pictures of like daily life. And you can see here, I found 
um, pictures of his, you know, his studio and his trailer. So um, I really like this picture because you can really, you can see, you know, like all the materials he's working with and it was covered with everything. Um, you can see that he was probably working all the time here. And here I kind of just juxtapose images where the left is um, a picture that I found in the archive of his, what his studio was. And the one is the, on the right is the one that I took when I was there. And here, um, you know, I again tried to take when I took the space in, looking at the walls, looking at the ceiling, the flooring, um, the windows, uh, just all the surroundings that I could. This is a picture of his um, his closet. You can see his jacket hanging over there, and the empty closet now. This was the wall um, next to the door. Uh, this was a really small space, and he's like that front room as. Um, as a studio, you can see his jacket or overalls kind of hanging there, um, and then the empty space on the right. And here are a couple of other parts of the home. Um, the I just like the wrinkles of like the, the counters and things. Um, you can also see uh, like the windows up there on the top. And so I. You know, created some um, prints with these as well. So um, I don't know if you remember uh, just from the, the photos before, but this was the flooring. But then there was also this piece that he used as like I don't know, kind of um, as an extra wall or something um, that I really like. So I took the pattern from there. This one was um, a side of the wall, and I think if you see that circular marking, it was maybe a lamp or, or a light fixture that used to hang there. And there was this like blue, like, you know, semicircle. Um, so I wanted to bring out that, that blue color there. And with this one, um, this was the bottom of the closet. So I uh, remember in the picture that I showed, and you know, most people will probably not be very interested in seeing, so I think it's, it's mold, um, but, I was really drawn to it and I thought it was really beautiful. I liked the gradation of the colors even. And um, I wanted to bring some of that out. And if I was a, a skilled printmaker, I would have probably um, tried to you know, do two-toned or something like that, but I'm, I'm not there yet. So here's, um, I did also made six prints um, from the trailer. Here. So when I was looking at James Castle's work, I um, found this one piece that I think it's the only one, but that was like an etching. And I really love this because the blue is, uh, you know, from the packaging and then he actually, you know, etched out the drawing or he carved out the drawing. A lot of the materials or the things that I found was most interested at the archive were actually more of like these kind of one-offs or like the foundational materials rather than sort of these like completed finished works just because there was just a lot of openness. Um, like, I feel like these were kind of like maybe things that he was going to use um, or, you know, I, I'm not really sure, you know, like maybe these are things that he just liked. He liked the look of them, the texture. Um, I thought that was a lot of sort of like potential energy in a lot of these things that, you know, kind of were kind of like, I think they didn't really know what to make of them because they were kind of like all in a box that, that was like, not really sure where to, um, organize. Um, and with my work, I use a lot of source material that's largely from my family's archive. Um, so a lot of photographs and letters and stamps and things like that. Um, my father passed away uh, six years ago. And so um, that kind of gave me that sort of impetus to think more about myself uh, and my identity, very specifically re in relation to my family, uh, my ancestors, my community, um, spaces of memory. And so I was really careful to preserve his belongings um, and use a lot of it you know, in my work. So here, um, this is a letter that um, was from my grandmother to my dad uh, when she was in Korea and he was in America. And this one particularly stuck out to me just as an object in itself. I just love the way, you know, the folds and the discoloration. There's some stains and particularly the bleed of the ink that sort of went through. And the um, original letter is the one on the left. Um, I did blur it out purposefully. Um, and it just feels so tactile as an image. 
And when I was looking at it, you know, I just realized like, you know, there's just, there's so much I don't really know about my path. And there's a lot of questions that were being raised. Um, so for example, I can't really read Korean very well. Um, and so that was when I, you know, I couldn't really, you know, I didn't really know what the letter was about. And also maybe I was thinking that I shouldn't be reading these. This is, you know, maybe I'm not the audience. They're not for me. Um, and so uh, what I did with the pieces on the right, um, I, I redacted all the stuff on the front facing um, part of the letter so that what you were sort of meant to read, I can't really read that um, when looking at the piece. And what you can really just see is what's left behind. So it's the bleed that's coming through from the other side. So it's a little bit more apparent in um, a letter like this. So this uh, was between my mom and my dad when um, she was still in Korea and my dad was in America, came to America. And they had a bunch of letters like back and forth. And every once in a while, I would see um, some English words that were popping out. Like there was, you know, um, visa or unemployment, um, collect call, you know, things like that. And it's just kind of, it was kind of fun to like, kind of just peruse, you know, like browse through and kind of see what's like popping out. Um, and this one in particular had this whole sentence that was in English. And um, so I, I really was interested in, you know, what made him write the sentence in English? Um, you know, how much did my mother understand? Why like this is a sentence that could have been written in Korean. So, um, it just, you know, I, I'll never know. Um, and I think that opens up a lot of questions. So again, the one on the left is the original letter and you can see on the right where I sort of redacted everything except for that one line. And you can see um, the bleed that's that's coming through from the other side. I use uh, text a lot in my work. Um, I've written a lot of my own. Um, I also source it from, again, my family's archive um, from other poets or, you know, other writers and things as well. Um, so um, with this work, I, is, it's actually the back of a photograph. Um, and there was a lot of questions surrounding uh, who was actually the people in the photograph. This was from um, my family's, I think my cousin sent it to me. And so I'd never seen this photograph, um, me or my, my mom or my sisters, and we, we didn't really know who it was. And so um, what I decided to do was instead of, thinking about the front is creating my own story, my own narrative um, on the back of it. Um, and, I, and just visually, I like sort of like the, the backing of the, the photo album, <laughs> you, you know, with old photo albums um, and like the lines of the photographs and stuff. And so I wrote some texts that were kind of based on what the photo might be. Um, some of it stems from memories that my parents have told me. Some of it's fabricated. Um, you know, it's it's sort of that idea of speculation. So this uh, piece is, um, actually this is not a piece yet. This is my father's notebook. Um, this one is, uh, he had written song lyrics, um, a, a notebook full of song lyrics. And um, most of them were in Korean songs, but he had a handful of, um, English or songs in English. So um, of course, I, those were the ones I, were, I was drawn to. So you can see, like, for example, these are very, you know, well-known songs at the time. There's like Scarborough Fair and Michelle by the Beatles. Um, and I, you know, I remember him when, you know, when I was a kid and him humming along to all these songs. And uh, I love that, you know, he, he loved them so much. He wanted to learn the lyrics and you can kind of tell, I can kind of see his process of, um, you know, listening to the song and, and writing them down. Um, and, you know, back then we couldn't really Google and just, you know, find the lyrics. This was probably in the 80s. Um, and what I found the most interesting was uh, when I was reading the lyrics, I realized he didn't always get them right. Um, <laughs> they weren't perfect. I mean, even as, you know, someone like me, you know, I'm a native English speaker. I remember when I was listening to Stearns as a teen, I, I didn't know, if it's, you know what some of the lyrics are either. Um, and my father, you know, English being a second language, of course, there's things that were kind of probably misunderstood or, you know, that just weren't as clear. Um, 
And I decided to, uh, you know, kind of focuses on those slippages and what sort of meanings I could draw from them, um, because I found that that was the most interesting about it. He kind of created his own um, his own song that way. And so what I decided to do was um, extract um, certain words um, from each of the songs, and um, here you can see this is this is the actual piece. Um, I went to create new meanings, um, new phrases uh, that were more open to interpretation. So with this, you could read in you know, many different ways here. So um, I put together two different songs um, and highlighted certain words. You can read them sort of left to right as normal. You can read one page at a time. You can read all the way across. You read up and down. Um, so this was just, um, I was intentionally constructing this piece to be you know, read in a way that doesn't have to be linear. So um, Carrot James Castle, I, um, when I knew I wanted to st still use uh, some you know, materials, so I brought some with me. And I was uh, really interested in some like notes that he had you know, written down. Um, there were some essays that he had written in college um, that talked about his life. Um, and so those are the ones I was thinking about. And this one in particular, um, it just, seem what's interesting to me because you know he was talking about philosophy or, or trying to figure out what it means and um you could tell it just seems like you know he was working things out you know he's like scratching things out and you know it's not a dictionary definition um this is his own sort of interpretation um really trying to figure it out and what i found most fitting about this work was that it's incomplete. <laughs> he doesn't end the last sentence. And so it's all, you know, in a way super frustrating, but I think that's kind of really indicative of what this is. And, you know, it's, um, I don't know what, you know, he, his complete thought is here. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to do something with this. I really liked, um, you know, he always, ha always had this really neat handwriting. And so um, I also wanted to experiment with embossing. I've been thinking about it for a while. And again, since it was a press year, I was, thought this would be the perfect opportunity. So um, you can see here, uh, it's, it's very subtle, but um, I embossed the, uh, the piece. So I have fragments. Um, I did one sentence, um, you know, kind of per, per sheet. Uh, they can be, so they can be kind of like read separately or they can be read all together. Uh, I really just really want to highlight the subtlety of the work. You can kind of see it's kind of ghostly. There's, it's just an, an imprint here. And so, you know, a lot of my work deals with, you know, thinking about memory, right? So a lot of times, you know, memory is, you know, you can remember it like yesterday and other times it's just kind of fleeting or, you know, kind of fading away. And so just interested in sort of what's left, what remains. Um, and here are just a couple of other photos of different angles. So you can kind of see the raised portions. Thank you. Um, and I didn't, I was looking back at my photos of uh, when I visited the archive and I found that I took a picture of this and I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is so fitting in a way because, so this is a book and so, you know, they're the same sides of, you know, of the page. And so, um, the, and you can see the right one is the back of the front, you know, the, the left page. And the right one is like, there's this like kind of foil or so. It kind of reminds me of, um, I don't know, when I was a kid, I used to take like gum wrappers and kind of peel off the foil and put on my binders. <laughs> it kind of it reminds me of, it's probably something, maybe something like that. And he uh, had, you know, I guess used, you know, a pencil or something to, um, right in the text and it's he pressed so hard that you can see on the first page the text coming through and so I was like oh he's doing his own embossing in that way and I, I, I just I love the the texture um it's it's so tactile you can kind of almost feel that looking at the picture I also decided to make some other embossed pieces. So these are other um, photos that I took of the shed uh, that I was interested in. It's the wallpaper that's, again, that's, you know, a lot of tears. It's old, it's crumbling. Um, and I just like the, the sort of indentions that it was making. 
And so I, this is um, a stencil that I created on the right to make for embossing. And here's the finished product. And, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's abstract. Like if you were to look at it, you would never know kind of like where it came from. Here's a, another example. And yes. Oh no, at BSU I was using the laser cutter, which I, I did use to make the, the stent. That's what I was using to make the stencils. So, um, so like this one, uh, which I I had seen that this was in it's in the uh, in the in the shed on the door doorway, and I was like, what is this? Like, and then the other day, Christian was saying like, oh yeah, I think it was his nephew or something. I can't remember exactly. Um, that stapled his name there, <laughs> and I just thought that was so funny. Um, so he he really left his mark. Um, so the the right is the stencil that I made, which it's it was it's laser cut, and. Uh, this one is really hard to see. It's a little bit more subtle, though. So, um, these are experienced better in person. Okay, so um, I'm from uh, a small city by Galveston, Texas, and um, after 20 years, I moved back to Galveston in 2021 to do the Galveston Artist Residency, and I was really excited because this was uh, an opportunity to, you know, finally research my hometown and um, my community, where I came from. And um, this is a picture of the Bell House uh, in the 1867 settlement, um, which was the only self-sufficient African-American community after emancipation in Galveston County. So the settlement was built on 320 acres of land um, that was purchased by three men um, after emancipation by several families. Uh, whose descendants are pretty prominent in the community still today. Um, and so while I was researching my, researching my hometown, I found that there wasn't really a lot of information about um, the settlement that I could find. And there was like a paragraph here or there, but there wasn't really in-depth information. Um, you know, when I searched online, I even went to local libraries and stuff. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I went to grade school with a lot of sort of the descendants of the founding families. And um, one in particular, um, Thank you, Janice, uh, really helped me with research. So she had a lot of like family books and documents um, that showed uh, an extensive family tree and brief histories of the first settlers uh, in that area. And so, you know, I was really impressed by the preservation of their family lineage and to show their like insistence uh, to document their existence there. Um, it's, you know, because, you know, a lot of my work is, is sort of making sure, you know, it's, it's all about preservation. And so, um, you know, a lot of this, uh, you, you can't really be found in like documents and books and maps and all those things, but it can be found in memories and stories from elders and things like that and how things get passed on. So uh, because a lot of the, you know, histories have been overlooked, that's kind of what I'm interested in kind of bringing out. Um, so I, how this history is being protected, um, what's being passed down through generations, um, and how family legacies are being preserved in the land. Um, I'm interested in spaces that are kind of more on the periphery that tend to be erased um, or forgotten. And so I want to break from those more traditional methods of telling history from the dominant perspective and instead uh, show a more nuanced perspective from those who are marginalized. So um, I've been showing pictures. This is the interior of the Bell House. Um, it's a second generation settlement home. Um, it was built from salvage wood from hurricanes. And uh, again, I was, I was you know, drawn to the deteriorating wallpaper, um, as you can see. And here there's um, these like images of houses that I really liked. Um, I'm not sure if there were stickers or there's wallpaper. I could also see like kids handwriting, um, maybe practicing the cursive or something, a lot of names. Um, and so, you know, looking at this wallpaper that's been kind of like broken and in pieces, I was really just trying to think of like, how can we tell a story that's kind of centering like the holes and the missing pieces? Um, how can we use uh, oral histories to kind of think about the future, the past, um, the present? So this, this is what I decided to make from, you know, the, the wallpaper that I found. 
So I was interested in this, you know, these little houses, um, you know, it's, it's home, it's a space for family, um, it's a safe space, it's grounding. And so really wanted to preserve that. So what I did was I extended the lines of the structure that was still kind of like standing um, and I extended them uh, laser cut in wood. So there were 11 in total. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, looking forward, um, sort of reimagining re futures and possibilities, thinking about growth and expansion sort of outside that box. And I think the, the negative spaces really allow us to speculate what's kind of been left behind or um, left out. And so how can we patch together um, the information that we do have here? So this is an installation view. And yet, as you can see, um, you can when I when you walk in, you can actually see the backs of them first. So it's not as readily apparent what they are. So you're able to kind of use your own imagination judgment first. And then when you turn around, you can see um, the pieces of the houses here. And you know, some are you know more fully formed than others. Here's a more of a close-up. So I'm, you know, interested in showing my work in more of an immersive capacity where you can see all sides of something. Um, I did a couple of large scale um, installations. Um, I don't have time to show a lot of them, but uh, I used paper screens that were laser cut with um, text uh, that I wrote um, or hand cut with designs and where I manipulated shadow and light through. Um, and so I'm really was really interested in creating that sort of space um, where you can kind of like walk around or be immersed within it. And so um, looking at James Castle's pieces, uh, you, if you know any of his work, he often draws on like packaging and matchboxes and you know like the back device computers, things like that. Um, he makes a lot of books, right? So they're meant to be seen from both sides, and. Um, and when I was reading this book over here, there was uh, a piece that, you know, that was writing like, maybe there are no fronts and backs, right? Maybe it, you know, it's meant to be a part of the piece. Like he's, maybe he's not just using that packaging because it's utilitarian, you know? Maybe he wants that to be a part of that piece. And I really liked um, the idea of that because, you know, I'm always interested uh, in sort of that, keep preserving that sort of history of that, that piece within it. Um, I was also really interested in his double-sided drawings. So this is um, the shed. And so I wanted to actually read a sh you know, very short piece from this book about um, what this, uh, this is from James Castle Show and Store book um, and where it talks about double-sided drawings. In a number of works, he engaged the idea of the double-sided drawing in a unique way. On one side of the paper, he would draw a room from one perspective, looking, say, from the doorway toward the windows. On the reverse side of the paper, he would draw the same room from the opposite perspective. In these reverse drawings, Castle positioned himself and us, the viewers, in more than one place. This does something. We get a sense of dimension and volume. It creates a spatial experience rather than a scene, a tableau. The room is recovered as a space, a place, rather than just a subject in a drawing. It becomes a lived room a space to be inhabited. It also does something else. It foregrounds the position of the maker, the artist, and shows us that his point of view is the fulcrum for all the work. By turning us around in one space, he makes us aware of his position. And I, I really like that. I won't read the whole thing because it's, it's a little long, um, but it's really good. And so um, here you can see that this is what he did is position stuff like sitting, Kind of like in one side of the room and then you know so you can kind of basically see both sides of the room here and in this one another double sided drawing i really like because it kind of does the the opposite in a way where you you are kind of going around the piece right you're seeing both sides of this um baby cram so i knew i wanted to um create work that you know that does this. I mean, I was doing this before, and I love that you know seeing it so beautifully articulated here. It's oh yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to create that sort of space, um, and it's not uh, again not just as a subject or you know that we're looking at something, but really making it dimensional and lived. 
So um, I, I'd already wanted to make pieces uh, with the wallpaper um, in the settlement house at the Bell House. Um, I know I used the houses, but I, you know, I really also loved the, you know, the newspaper that was kind of peeking through wallpaper here. Um, again, the tears and the holes and the stuck scene here. So I wasn't really quite sure what to do with them. Um, and then I found this piece, which was incredibly important because this was the only part that I found that had a date on it. And so you can, if you can see, it's from uh, November 14th. 1909, and um, I knew this was in Galveston County, so it was probably, you know, the, the big newspaper there. And so through a lot of digging, I found the actual newspaper. So I was able to find, just through searching um, the newspaper archive, um, pieces and matched up like, oh, okay, this is um, the newspaper. So on the left, it's, you know, the wallpaper. Um, at the house, and on the right is the newspaper that I actually found that fit in with it. So I I wanted to kind of, you know, figure out, you know, I wanted to know what the unknown was and fill in the gaps, right? I didn't want it to be a, like a reproduction um, or like a copy of it, um, or that knowing that, you know, I didn't want to complete in the way that's like, oh, this is gonna be perfect and you know finished, but it's supposed to be more of a new iteration um, of what, you know, like kind of like the next level of what it could be. So this is the piece. So um, this is double-sided. So um, on the left, you can see the newspaper. On the right is the wallpaper. Um, and you can, and it's the rest of the newspaper is etched. It's laser cut in plexiglass. So um, it's a little bit hard to see um, in photos, but um, you can see that it's basically completing what is not there anymore. And the same thing with the wallpaper, um, which I, that I laser cut and I etched. So again, this is a double sided piece. It's sort of, it's, it's installed hanging so that you were able to kind of walk around it. Um, here are some side views, so you can kind of see the layers of the piece. Here is another example that I did. So again, the left is the original, the right is the newspaper that I found. And here's the piece. So when I came to the James Castle House, I was uh, immediately drawn to this room right over here. I don't know if um, y'all have seen it, but um, if you haven't, you should really take a look. So in, in, in the room over there, uh, you can see basically kind of like the same thing where there's um, newspaper on the walls. And this used to be the exterior of the home. So the newspaper was just mainly meant to insulate. Um, so there was no wallpaper on that side, but you can see, you can see there's um, a bunch of newspaper um, that's all over the walls over there. And again, I, you know, I'm so glad that there was this front, again, a front page. So you can see this is uh, Bo Boise Capital News. And um, I think it's dated 1933. I can't remember the exact date. And so with, uh, with some help, <laughs> can see uh, that we find the actual newspaper here. And so I wanted to do the same type of process um, as I did with the other pieces. Um, the only thing was that there was no wallpaper since again, this was the exterior of the house. But um, if you remember the pictures that I showed of the shed, um, if you remember that nice sailboat <laughs> wallpaper, I was like, this is, would be perfect to use. And so that's what I decided on. And, um, so basically the, the wallpaper I decided was, was just going to be the negative space. And so again, you know, kind of filling in the gaps with the newspaper, the rest of the newspaper article or with the wallpaper design. There's a sort of side view of the pieces. And here's uh, another one that I did. 
this one was uh, an advertisement <laughs> that I thought was kind of funny. And here um, I used another wallpaper pattern um, that was here at the James Castle House. And there's one thing that I, I really wanted. I actually went through several iterations of this <laughs> and uh, every time, because there's always something missing. And one thing that I, that I realized was I, I needed some sort of transparency to through what you're looking at, like literally. I mean, I was using plexiglass, but I had, um, you know, obviously there's layers of wood and paper in between. And so um, I really wanted this transparency because, you know, thinking about, you know, uh, this history, the past, like all this, this research and things can be so murky and obscure. I felt like th there needed to be some sort of light <laughs> through. And so um, I wanted there to be at least like one moment of clarity. So um, I know, you know, every one is a little bit different, um, but uh, when there were like holes or things in the newspaper, I decided to kind of laser cut it all the way through. So here you can kind of see on the left, um, that's actually, you can, you can see through. Um, it's just that the back is white, so it just looks like. Here's in their side view. And um, I think with this piece, I also really wanted it to feel like, you know, obviously I wanted, you know, you can kind of go around um, and experience it, but I wanted also to feel like you're sort of within the walls somehow. <laughs> and so um, when you're looking at it, you're finding, you know, this information that was lost um, or, you know, that was not really meant to be there. And so um, sort of kind of filling that space. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but um, to kind of feel like you're within that space instead of also, instead of just kind of like looking at something. Okay, and that's the last slide. Thank you so much, Jean. That was incredible. Um, we're going to open it up for uh, a question and answer period if anyone has any specific questions that they have about her process. And in the meantime, while we wait for that, I just want to say how much I realized I've overlooked. <laughs> and I'm on site every single week. And I feel like you've brought my own attention to all of these small details that when you look over something, in its entirety, you completely miss all of the patterns and the the little bits of newspaper. And so personally, I am grateful for um, the way that you're able to highlight these fragments that I think are overlooked so often. This was your first time for anything. And if so, how did it add to or change the process? Uh, for the people online, we got a question. Uh, was this your first time printmaking and how um, did it add or change your process? Yes, it was my first time. <laughs> and it was really difficult. Um, but I, 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 I don't, I'm just trying to think of like how it changed my process. I mean, again, it's like this idea of like this transfer, which I think I tend to do quite often, just not in, in this specific way. Um, you know, kind of making like etching when I was, um, I used like one million blocks. Um, so I've been, Kind of playing around with like making stamps and things like that so i've been experimenting with things just never kind of really kind of followed through it on a, on it all the way yet so yeah but i mean i would like to continue doing it but i might need to take like a real class or something at some point so how, at what point in time did you realize that you uh, for the people online, at what point did Jean realize that loss was um, a large subtext for her? I mean, I think it was there from the start, really. Um, my, I want to say first, like, complete body of work um, was about my family. This was before my dad passed, but, um, or actually during, before and during. Um, and it was, my, my parents had a struggling motel business. And so every time I visited, I would take photos and I can see like the deterioration of the space and sort of like the struggles that my parents were going through. And so there was always sort of like that thread. And then of course, with the physical loss of my dad, um, there was, you know, that was obviously a, a big turning point. Um, 
but not even just that, I just kind of looked around, like I actually had, you know, visited my hometown kind of frequently. Um, and I noticed like for, you know, my um, school district was annexed by the city next door. So um, I, I don't know, just there were so many things for some reason that I kind of felt was, you know, gradually being taken away. And so it just always been there in my work, yeah. Um, we have a couple questions online. I'll start with um, Michelle Sloan. Uh, why were newspapers on the walls? How did you create the newspaper fragments for the piece? Is it from a photograph? Yes, uh, so newspapers on the walls, I think th since this seems to be pretty common, I think it was either for installation and, or for, news for backing of the wallpaper. Um, and how I created it was I did take a photo of the piece of the piece, um, it, as highest quality photo that I could get, and then just did a lot of editing to make it legible. Um, and then she also left a comment as well, the embossings, especially the one with the unfinished thoughts about philosophy reminded me of welts on skin or scar tissue. And I think that that's a really interesting comment. I hadn't thought of it that way, but once that was pointed out, I, I agree. Um, we have another question from Christina. Uh, was the dual-sided project from the Bell House using newspaper and wallpaper inspired by Castle's work, or was that a happy coincidence that caused you to try something similar during this residency? Um, it was a happy coincidence. Uh, I was already planning to do something with the wallpaper. I didn't completely know what. I had something in my head, and it, what I, what came out of it was something similar. Um, not, you know, I, again, I went through a lot of iterations while I've been here, but uh, and yeah, and then when I was here, I saw the, the newspaper wallpaper here and I thought it was perfect. So it just really worked out. Historic homes, we have a lot of insulation and wallpaper. Yeah. yeah. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yeah. So the, um, the, the plate with the cutouts was run through the press and then the paper going into the cutouts is what created the embossing, is that correct? Yes, uh, just clarifying that the wooden plates with the cutouts um, that had been laser cut were put through the press with the paper over it to create the embossing. Yeah. This is something in the Bell House project. The, it was wallpaper of homes, different homes. And then what you did in your rendering is was it that the space became where the homes existed on the wallpaper was the boy, it was about what's missing and what's there. <laughs> but I, I didn't quite yeah, yeah. have the grid of line represented missing space, but I wasn't sure what you meant by mm -hmm. what the missing space in the wall over or a question just clarifying from um the Bell House homes that were or the homes that were stickers or fragments that were on the walls of the Bell House, um what negative space was utilized for that? I want to kind of go back to so you can see the picture. Okay, so this is um the picture of the piece, but um now what I did was uh, each each one is kind of standalone, um, so they don't actually, even though they're they were all there, they're they're all uh, separate. Um, basically, the lines that are kind of you can see that are emerging from the image are from sort of like I say structural elements, although they're not necessarily structural, but there are the lines that were already kind of in the image, if that makes sense. Um, you might have to, I don't know if you look up closer, but there's like, let's see if there's, you know, from the walls here, you can see, or from like the bottom, like foundational parts, um, some the roof lines, things like that. Is it confusing? Yeah. yeah. So the line is represented. Been missing from the line, right, right. Yeah. Um, I have my own question actually uh, going off of this. Do you feel that your degree in architecture informed your emphasis on space and negative space and almost the structural integrity of some of the pieces? I think it probably uh, <laughs> subconsciously does. Um, 
I don't think I do it purposefully, but uh, but yeah, maybe I've always been kind of interested in the way the, the body in relation to work, um, because it's not just, again, like I don't, if you, you know, just looking at something on the wall or, um, you know, just seeing it visually is, uh, I want to create like a more, a more full experience. Um, I missed a question on here. Um, while you were working in the James Castle space and seeing his work and uh, learning about him, do you feel that creating your pieces is like being in dialogue with him? Yeah, I think so. I think in a lot of ways, um, I found that we there was a lot of similar connections I had to James Castle um, after reading and things. And I, I don't feel like I had to like make my stuff like fit in <laughs> to a lot of the things that he was thinking about, um, but that we were, a lot of the things that just ha you know happened to kind of go on you know parallel tracks in that way. Um, so I just was able to find a lot of common ground. I think. Um, a question on how um, having both stayed at Searle's place in Boise, which is a residency, and then also James Castle House, um, how that impacted her process. I think with the living residencies, it's really nice because you get to, yeah, like be in that space, um, see how they the artists were living, um, get to do, you know, you know, research a little bit about um, the artists, but also that, you know, we have people in the room that knew Cyril and, um, and things like that, which is, you know, really nice to have. Um, but in terms of, you know, process and making work, it's just, it's, it's just a, a gift to, we had like unlimited time to create a new space. And um, I would say it's, it's probably similar in a lot of ways. It's just that James Castle uh, was a little bit longer. So I was just able to um, get a little bit more in depth um, here. Or work on more, or I'll say I was able to work on multiple projects at one time. I think I'll wrap it up by asking what your favorite part of Boise is now that you've been here twice. Yeah, um, good question. Uh, I mean, I love the that the mountains are right there, the foothills, and I also love that there's a river right there too. So um, that's been really fun because you kind of get the best of both worlds. And we have a couple more questions on it. Sorry, I was switching up again. Um, I'm thinking of your prints from within the James Castle house. How would you describe your experience of finding those little details? Are you sensitive to particular patterns and are you actively looking for them? Yeah, I think um, I probably am a little bit sensitive to finding these things um, just from my work in general. Like I I think I, I just talked a little bit about how um, my one of my first bodies of work was uh, my parents uh, documenting their time at um, the motel that they owned. I uh, actually went back um, a couple, like a year or two after, I can't remember exactly when, um, that my parents, you know, since my dad got sick, you know, we weren't able to run the motel anymore. And I could see like notes that were still in my mom, you know, my mom's handwriting <laughs> and things like that just around or things that have just not been touched. And um, I don't know. So it, it just goes back from always like, I, I'm just like always kind of looking for those things. Um, also with a lot of these like, spaces that you know like the shed and the trailer um or the bell house there's you know because of there's like these old homes there's there's nothing to actually like kind of look at in that way there's not you know there's there's no furniture there's no object in there it's the structure itself and so um you really have to that's that's really all you have and so um and again they can still very be very easily the details can be overlooked and so um i mean in some ways it's it's really great to have people that know the space um, point stuff out to you. I know at the Bell House, um, somebody did point out like, oh, look at this here. And look, are you interested in this there? And, um, you know, luckily, you know, you, if you have somebody like a guide that could kind of, you know, just point you to things that you might be interested in as you're kind of looking around, you can, you know, discover your own stuff. So um, I always love that sort of element of surprise. And I try to keep that in my work. 
We'll do one more question from online. Um, in your meditation on the history and materials of the site, could you speak to your sense of being present and perhaps something unexpected or intimate you sensed about James Castle? Sense of being present. I mean, I think with that part, I try to, I mean, a lot of times I try to like plan my project in advance and, you know, in my head, it's, it's looks a certain way. And then when I actually produce it, it's something different. And so I think in terms of like materials and the things here, I have to kind of go along with um, the process and what it might, you know, it might become like, you know, like the printmaking was a lot of them were such a fail <laughs> and um, it was really frustrating, but, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, in some ways it's sort of the, um, the joy of printmaking, I think, is sort of that unexpected or that surprise of what you might get. Um, but yeah, again, like the different iterations of work that I was um, creating, um, I just, I went through a lot of it. Uh, and then the second part, something I intimate, something unexpected or intimate, I sense about James Castle. Um, I'm not, I don't really, I'm not really sure. I just, I think we'll, more so it's that I I was trying to kind of get a little bit more into his head and what he might be thinking about when he was creating the work. Um, because, you know, since, you know, he never, obviously never wrote anything, we don't, we can only extrapolate from <laughs> what uh, the pieces are. And so it's just this way of like, this openness that um, I think I try to emulate in my work, um, where I want everybody to have a, a specific relationship um, with with the piece. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jean. It's been a huge honor having you at the James Castle House. Um, I personally enjoyed watching you explore the new techniques and then how your open studios have exploded in terms of physical work being. Or, from the switch from digital to physical work. Um, so please join us tomorrow from 11 to one for Jean's final open studio event. And please visit our website, jamescastlehouse.org for more information on other events. So have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.